I'm grateful to be here with all of you today. Am I audible? Clearly? Yes, to me. Yes. And I okay. Thank you. Om Gyan Timirandhasya Gyanan Yunishalakaya Chakshuron Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Pashyati Desha Tarine Vancha Kalpataru Vyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhyevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vasadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Can I share my screen Prabhu? I would like to. Okay. Uh, feel free Prabhu. Okay, so I think I got it. So thank you very much for the opportunity today to be of service to you. And this is a very exalted topic to discuss. This is a discussion on Lord Chaitanya's conversation with Ramananda Rai. So we'll be focusing, because it's a very vast topic, and we will focus on some aspects of that discussion. This, I'll, I'll analyze this in broadly four parts, the context, the content, the consequence, and the relevance. So the content itself can go into several classes, but I, we will we will you discuss some aspects of the content. Now, the Chaitanya, Lord Chaitanya's pastimes are described primarily in the Chaitanya Charita Amrit and in several other biographies also. The Chaitanya Charita Amrit, among the various biographies, has a distinctive style. That is that. It describes events, but wherever Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has philosophical conversations, it zooms in over there and elaborates them. In that sense, when we say read the Bhagavatam, sometimes we may see long prayers by certain, certain characters. And it's a dramatic pastime going on and suddenly there are long prayers. And we may just skip the prayers and go ahead. The prayers are very illuminating, but sometimes in the context of the drama, they may, dramatic action that is happening, you may say, oh, I just want to go ahead and know what, what happened. So there is dramatic action, which is which naturally attracts our attention. But Chaitan Chaitanamrat is not in that sense, like a crowd pleasing book. It is beautiful poetry, no doubt. But although it is beautiful poetry, that doesn't mean that it, it, it focuses on pleasing the crowd. The Chaitanya Charita Amrit is more like a book of theology in the format of a biography. So it has a biographical format, not in, entirely, but the first seven chapters are elaborate philosophy, the theology more specifically. Philosophy is more about the nature of reality. Theology is more about the nature of God. So the Chaitanya Charita Amrit is more about theology. And, but the more significant thing for us is that Krishnadas Kaviraj Goswami focuses on conversations. He describes events, dramatic events, he describes beautifully, but he focuses on conversations. There's one reason for it, many, but one reason was Krishnadas Kaviraj Goswami wanted to establish through his book the the intellectual, philosophical, and spiritual authority of Lord Chaitanya's teachings. And that's why there are elaborate chapters on the, not just the incidents, but the philosophy. And one such elaborate chapter comes in the Madhya Leela of the Chaitanya Charita Amrit, 
that is the discussion between Ramanand Rai and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And among various philosophical conversations that Lord Chaitanya has with various people, this in one sense is unique. There are five major conversations Lord Chaitanya has with, with, with uh, various characters. So his conversations, we can say they're at a degree, a hierarchy. His conversations with say, Rama, with Prakashan and Saraswati and Sarvamam Bhattacharya. They are primarily to transform. They are, um, both of them are having an impersonal conception of life. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu speaks deep philosophy to transform their hearts. So they are more for the purpose of transformation. Uh, then there are the conversations, he has another set of conversations with Rupa Goswami and Sanatana Goswami. They are also very deep. They are more for the purpose of instruction. Rupa and Sanatana Goswamis have already accepted him as a great authority for Prakashan Saraswati and Aromatacharya. They okay, they respect him as sannyasi, but but they not accepted him as the authority person. So his speech is to transform them to accept not just his authority, but the authority of bhakti. With Rupa Sanatana Goswami, it's more for instruction. And with Ramananda Rai, it is different in two ways. It's not because it's not a vertical that he's 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 transforming or instructing someone. They're simply reciprocating. It's a discussion. And not only is it a discussion, the flow of the discussion is significantly uh, the other way. In most other conversations with Lord Chaitanya, who is speaking and others are hearing, although, of course, with respect to Sarom Bhattacharya, Lord Chaitanya hears from him for seven days. But what he speaks there, what he hears is not described in the Chaitanya Charitamrath. And that is not considered the, primarily the part of the conversation. But here Ramanandara speaks. And here, there's a very important uh, lesson which we'll come to later. That, but the, in the context, this is a very distinctive conversation that where Lord Chaitanya hears. And moreover, the point is not just the, not just the discussion. It, it's simply a discussion for appreciation and relishing, for appreciating and relishing. So there is no, it's not so much instruction, but it's just, you could almost say that when two equals meet each other, but they're just relishing the discussion. What Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, bodhayanta parasparam, bodhayanta parasparam. Tushanti charamanti they relish it. So in one sense, this discussion is the model for all of us, how we can connect with and reciprocate with devotees. I'll come to that, to the conclusion, but this is the context. So let's move, look, look a little bit more at the context. Listen. So uh, look at, let's look, understand Ramanand Rai's background. You know, he will, now who is so worthy for having a conversation with the Lord as an equal? So Ramanand Rai would by most standards be considered an unlikely candidate for this. Why an unlikely candidate? Because at that time, he, the society in India was caste, quite, was quite caste conscious. In fact, far more caste conscious than Krishna conscious. And yet, what happens over there is, so he, so Ramanrai was born in the Karanam caste, which is similar to the Kayasthas. And they were not considered to be the highest of castes. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was born in the Brahmana family. And the Brahmanas were quite proud of their high birth at that time. Now, this is not a, this is not a desirable thing. It was considered a deviation. And some things in scripture are, are prescriptive about what we should do. And some things are descriptive. This is how things were at that time. The descriptive part is not necessarily prescriptive. That there was a caste system that is described in the... There's caste consciousness that is described in Chaitanya Charitamra. That Haridas Thakur is not allowed in the Jagannath Puri temple. That's described there. That is a descriptive part. That's not a prescriptive part. So everything in scripture is not necessarily the teaching of scripture. Sometimes scripture may just be describing the sociocultural reality at a particular time. But the point is, 
within that sort of social cultural reality, the unlikeliness of this conversation is highlighted. So he was born in a little lower caste, and Bhavananda Rai, with his father, he had five sons. Among him, Ramanand was the eldest. They were both born in Orissa. Lord Chaitanya, I mean, as you know, appeared in Bengal, but he resided in Orissa at Jagannath Puri. And during he, after arriving at Jagannath Puri and transforming Sarov Mattacharya, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu went to the South India tour. At that time, Sarov Mattacharya told him that, Kabur, you will find a very exalted Vaishnava, Ramanand Rai. Earlier, I did, not, I did not value him, but now I understand how great he is. You associate with him, it will be very satisfying for you. If you consider his lineage from the perspective of not just material but spiritual perspective, it described that he is a disciple of Raghavendra Puri, who was an important associate of Lord Chaitanya, and he was a grand disciple of Madhavendra Puri. Now that brings him, in one sense, to the in terms of initiation, he is at the same level as Lord Chaitanya. Lord Chaitanya himself is a grand disciple of Madhavendra Puri through Ishwar Puri. So we have Raghavendra Puri through Ishwar Puri, there is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Raghavendra Puri through, sorry, Madhavendra Puri through Raghavendra Puri is Ramanand Rai. So both of them are in that sense equal. However, if we consider further, when they met each other, when they saw each other, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was a sannyasi and Ramanand Rai was the, was the, in some ways, the governor, whatever the functionary, uh, the English translation often is governor, but he was the administrative head of that place, of not just Kavur, but the whole area over there. And he was naturally accompanied by Brahmanas as he was going for bathing. At that time, even if the Brahmanas were not very pure, not very spiritual, the Brahmanas would be kept by the kings and the, of, and the heads of state. So that around them, so that they would have a uh, have a some appearance of piety, and they would look good in a religious society. That oh, we maintain brahmanas, we're surrounded by brahmanas, we discuss with brahmanas, and the brahmanas would sometimes spend time with the heads of state because the brahmanas also needed sponsors, they needed maintenance. So these brahmanas were not particularly spiritually evolved, but they were religious, they were pious. So they were going with Ramanand Rai when he's going to take a bath. And Raman and Raya and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu saw each other and they rushed toward each other and they embraced each other for a very long time. Now, from the socio political, socio economic perspective, Raman and Raya was the, was the head of the state over there. And Lord Chaitanya was a sannyasi. Normally, sannyasis are respected and they were, at least at that time, respected much more 500 years ago. But still, Lord Chaitanya was an unknown sannyasi. Even among sannyasis, uh, there are some sannyasis who are very well known. And Lord Chaitanya at that time was quite unknown. So the Brahmanas were bewildered. Why is this? Why is this our head of state going and going and embracing a sannyasi? Normally, if sannyasi is there, you may offer you may offer some respects from a distance, be reverential. You don't expect such intimacy as embrace with sannyasi. And then on the other side, they were surprised. Why is the sannyasi embracing a person who is socio, who is socio hierarchically like a shudra? No, the, the brahmanas would would serve him, Ramanand Rai. They would perform rituals for him, perform sacrifices for him, but they kept their distance. They considered him to be a relatively lower caste person. And here, <coughs> here Lord Chaitanya was embracing. So this itself is an indicate this this context where both of them they go beyond convention. This is a pointer to what is going to come in the discussion. So what is going to come is that which transcends normal conceptions and conventions. Conceptions refer to how we think, and conventions refer to how we act. So in every society, there are some normal conceptions and normal conventions. Here, the conversation between Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Ramanand Rai is going to go beyond con ordinary conceptions and go beyond ordinary conventions, both. So both of them hugged each other for a long time. 
And then they, uh, then Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Ramanarayana noticed, they sensed the bewilderment, the puzzle meant on the faces of the Brahmanas and they decided, okay, we have, we have to come to external consciousness. So they separated from each other. And <clears throat> they, what did they do thereafter? They decided that they will, um, that they said they will meet later. I want to discuss with you. Both of them said, yes. Raman Rai humbly said, I want your association. You know, my mind is not pure. By your association, I'll become purified. And Shaitan Mahaprabhu said, actually, I am simply a Mayavadi Sanyasi. It is only by associating with a Vaishnava like you that I will get some love for Krishna. So both of them again spoke according to external convention. That external convention is a, a Sanyasi is considered pure. So association with the Sanyasi will purify a Grahastha. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu took a humble position. There are many times when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu identifies himself not based on his heart, but based on his aff affiliation, that I am just a Mayavadi Sanyasi. That's because he had taken initiation in a Sampradaya, which was Mayavadi. That was the purpose, because that Mayavadi was respected at that time. So he he talked about that Sanyas, but he's, he's the topmost devotee. He's Krishna in the mood of Radharani. But that is just the humility. And then they met that night. So this is, we till now discuss the context. Now, as I mentioned, the content goes to a very high level. But let's look at some aspects of the content. So what they discuss is, what is the ultimate purpose of life? What is it that is, what is it that we all should do in life? So for all of us, we are doing various activities. We may have having our careers, we have our families, we may have our hobbies, we may have our, uh, some. sometimes we have some unhealthy habits. So we do various things and some people, some, some things we do wholeheartedly, some things we do half-heartedly. But what is it that will give us the highest results in life? You know, what is it that will be most rewarding? So there is a hierarchy which they discuss and I will not go into the hierarchy technically, but just let's look at it in a broad sense. So first, uh, Raman Rai says, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, when he asks this question, you know, what is, what, is, what is one's duty? What should one do to achieve the perfection of life? So in one sense, this is, some, this is a conversation that has echoes throughout the scriptures. Mm -hmm. In the, in the Mahabharata question, driving question is, what is dharma? Now, dharma in that context means, what is the right thing to do? The driving question of the Ramayana is, who is an ideal person and what are the characteristics of an ideal person? And the answer is Ram and Ram's characters are described. And thereby, the activities of Ram are also considered to be ideal in that sense. The driving question of the Bhagavatam is, what is the duty of a person? What is the best thing for a person who is about to die? So the idea that there are so many options for us to act and we need to choose, we need to prioritize. We have limited time, we have limited energy, we have limited, limited capacities. So what is it? Where should we invest our time, energy and capacities? So that is a universal question not just for within the Vedic canon, but for all of humanity. And here, so the, the answers are given in some ways, the answers in the Ramayana, the Mahabharata and the Bhagavatam are similar to what is the answer given Chaitanya Charitamrata. The difference is Chaitanya Charitamrata goes to a higher and higher and higher level in giving the answer. So that's why you see a pyramid over here. And so, the conception of the ultimate purpose of life also is different for different people. So at one level, Ramanandaraya starts and he says, yeah, it is the duty of Varanashram. Varanashram is a system which is given by the Lord. Varanashram basically refers to the position within society which we have according to our social and spiritual <clears throat> location on the journey of life. And then we do our duty. Such duty ensures that we are gradually purified and the society social structure is maintained. <coughs> so Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, Iha bhai, aage kao ar. That this is true, but it's external. That he doesn't reject it in the sense of calling it false, 
but he says this is external which is significant so what is it, what is this conversation doing again and again chetan mahapur says if abhaya this is external the idea is that within scripture also there are many different layers and only those who want to go to the deepest layer can go to the deepest layer so there are many layers which need to be peeled peeled so like we had the churning of the ocean that is described but there are many desirable objects that come but when you keep churning keep churning then we go to the most desirable object that comes so like some people might just get satisfied with the initial products so then he says that actually just doing one's duty is not enough one should do one's duty in a mood of devotion ृजन and he says yes this is good he have by age ka ho aa hai the mahapur then reject it he says it's superficial it's external go deeper go deeper now we may wonder why what's wrong with sarva dharman paritaj isn't that very high we are announcing our duties yes it is very high but there are higher knowledge still so then he talks about gyan mishra bhakti so one may renounce one's duty for the purpose of surrendering but one may not have much spiritual realization at that time so we could say the first two levels are going to a karma mishra bhakti then one once renounces the world but after renouncing the world what next this renunciation is not enough there has to be a higher connection the prabhupad says in a lecture that he could the sarva dharma pratyaj verse 1866 in the bhagavad gita and he says even the hippies had done sarva dharma pratyaj that they had given up their duties to their society to their family to their nation to they you could say to their career to even their own bodily hygiene but he said i taught them maam ekam sharanam raja i taught them how to surrender to krishna and that is extremely important so so that is a higher level one may renounce with the renunciation without realization renunciation without absorption that is not considered very elevated so then he says okay beyond that one gets spiritual realization one becomes absorbed in bhakti understanding that actually krishna is beyond brahman so brahma bhuta prasannatma na shochati na kaanshati samah sarveshu bhuteshu mad bhaktim labate param one will attain mad bhaktim labate param you'll attain my devotion and he says yes in her bhai aage ka hoar So what has happened? One has come from the Brahman conception to the Bhagwan conception, and that's why some taints of the Brahman conception might still be there. That's why it's considered Jnana Mishra Bhakti. And then beyond that, then it talks about Kevala Bhakti, simply absorption in the Lord. Kevala in this context means uh, only pure, exclusive, nothing else. So that means we love the Lord simply because the Lord is so lovable. not because of what he will give us no many times people worship god and we may also pray to krishna to get something desirable from him that is okay at least we are praying to god and krishna says that such people are sukrutina they are they are well intentioned they are they are good but they are not the best the best is to understand that krishna is krishna's greatest blessing krishna is krishna's greatest blessing if krishna manifests in our hearts he will enrich our hearts in a way that nothing else can in the world and that is life's highest perfection but then he goes further and he says in kevala bhakti we may love the lord purely but the lord also has many manifestations the manifestation of vishnu of narayan of narsimha of ram of krishna in uh, dwarka and then like that the hierarchy goes up and absorption in the divine couple and specifically the divine couple that is referred to here is as radha krishna now why is that considered the highest now that is a big subject many reasons but primarily that's because 
तो राधा कृष्ण मैनिफेस्ट द मोस्ट इंटीमेट लव दाइंड ऑफ अफेक्शन बिटवीन लक्ष्मी एंड नारायण और इवन सीता एंड राम डिजेंट कम एज टू एज इंटीमेट लेवल एज इट कम्स इन द केस ऑफ राधा एंड कृष्ण so then chaitanya mahaprabhu is very satisfied from the level of keval bhakti only chaitanya mahaprabhu says yes yeh hai aage ka hoar he says yes this is it but now go deeper into now go deeper into it so there are two kinds of going deeper one is this is not this is superficial so go deeper this is right but now go deeper into this so go deeper into this so there is a going deeper into something which is which is all, which is right also that we need to go deeper into so that's how it goes deeper and deeper to discuss very elevated subjects of radharani's love for the lord so this is now this discussion of uh, pure devotion in the mood of the love of radha radha and krishna and how the devotees love radha and krishna that is the zenith that is the highest and why is radharani love the highest because she is the most selfless she is she has in one sense no concern for herself her concern is only for krishna's pleasure and whatever it takes to give krishna pleasure she is ready to do that the love is characterized by selflessness love the essence of love is giving the essence of lust is taking sometimes we differentiate lust in terms of sexuality and love in terms of spirituality that is true but that may not be very practical in terms of how do we interact because we have so many different relationships with people so we could put it other way is that the essence of love is giving the essence of lust is taking so whenever we see someone how do we know whether <clears throat> now that person may be of the may not, we know may not normally consider that by relationship with them is tainted with lust but there could be lust for power there could be lust for control lust for exploitation so if we see someone and the first thought in our mind is what can this person do for me that means we are in material consciousness our relationship is tainted by lust but as soon as we see a person we think what can i do for this person that is that is love and this love is manifested at the highest level in radharani where her whole being is offered for the pleasure of krishna and we know this in the past time where narad muni asked for the dust of krishna's devotee so that krishna could be relieved from the headache and radharani was the foremost among the devotees who was gopis was ready to do that and she said that and adhun said you you'll go to hell if the dust of your feet touches krishna's head and radharani said yes i know that but for me just the thought that krishna has headache is hell i can't bear it it's just go quickly and relieve krishna of his headache and if i can relieve krishna of his headache for even one moment that's worth going to hell forever also so that is the selflessness of radharani's love and that selflessness can manifest in different ways depending on the particular mood particular uh, leela that is being performed but radharani there is no love that can come even close to radharani's love her whole being is how can i please krishna she she aspires to fulfill all the desires of krishna to her fullest capacity and then as chaitanya mahaprabhu is speaking more and more Uh, so Ramanand Rai keeps speaking more and more. Then Chaitanya Mahaprabhu keeps asking more and more. And at one point, Ramanand Rai says, "You know, I had not thought that anyone could inquire anything beyond this." So Ramanand Rai is also in ecstasy. Sometimes we may study very deep aspects of scripture, but those aspects are so deep that there is no appropriate audience to speak it. And if somebody is worthy enough to speak, some audience is already evolved enough. They are rasika enough. उंडेड नो वन इंक्वाड बियॉन्ड दिस 
and Ravan Rai is ecstasy, keeps speaking, keeps speaking. And then at one point, Ravan Rai starts speaking a song which describes an extremely intimate pastime of Lord Chaitanya, of Lord Krishna with Radharani. And when this extreme intimately, extreme intimacy is being described, Lord Chaitanya puts his lips in Ramana Rai. He puts his lips in him. So the idea is that, that when the Lord is performing intimate pastimes, that has to be respected. That is not to be publicized to everyone. That's why the mood is the, the Prabhupada also said the gopis' pastimes, they have to be ex, the Krishna's pastimes, the gopis, they are they are exalted pastimes. And they're not to be spoken to everyone because they can be easily misunderstood. They can be misunderstood to be mundane, mundane, mundane sexuality. Whereas they are the topmost spirituality. So even Lord Chaitanya and Ramananda Rai, when there is no possibility of misunderstanding because both of them are completely devoted, but there also they bring a stop. They discuss no more. This is an indication for all of us that we discuss appropriate subjects. Sometimes we may speak a very exalted subject to somebody who is not who is not at that level, and they may get confused. Or the exalted, or sometimes we may discuss a subject that may just be too overwhelming for somebody. But the purpose of discussion is actually to elevate others, to elevate others, and to speak. That's why we have to speak appropriately. Even Krishna in the Gita says. That especially the last part of the Gita, which is very confidential, Krishna is pouring out of the heart. Krishna is expressing his love. There, Krishna says that this has to be spoken confidentially. That don't speak this to everyone. Those who are not austere, those who don't have a devotional disposition, those who don't have a service attitude, don't speak to those. So the idea is not that it literally shouldn't be spoken, but the idea is that we, we need to be aware of what is the effect of what we are speaking. Is it going to elevate the person or is it going to agitate the person? Is it going to trigger attraction or is it going to trigger, say, envy? So we have to be cautious. So Lord Chaitanya silences Ramana Rai over here. And then let's look at some, some big vignettes from their discussion, which indicate then there are short, short sutra link discussions. So quick, it's like if we could say after this elaborate discussion, there is like a rapid fire quiz. So in rapid fire quiz, the question is short and specific, and the answer also has to be short. So this is also there. Many this mood of say short question, short answer. This is quite often there in our Vedic scriptures. You see in the in the Yaksha's conversation with Yudhishthira in the Mahabharata also something similar is there. So that this also there are more than a dozen items of, around a dozen items, but I have chosen three to discuss over here. So what does he talk about over here? So the essence of devotion is a redefinition of values. The more our devotion increases, what happens? The more we realize that it is the Lord who is, who is the supreme value for us. Nothing else matters except the Lord. So based on that devotional redefinition of values, let's look at some things. So he asks the question, what is the best education that Mahaprabhu asks? And Ramananda Rai says, the best education is devotion to Krishna. Now we may say, okay, education and devotion. Okay, it's an interesting connection. So we may talk about, if today if you ask people, what is the best education? They may say, okay, I want to go to an Ivy League university. That's the best education. Well, okay, let's try to understand this from a, a broader perspective. If you consider what is knowledge? In today's world, knowledge is equated with skills. Okay, somebody's done engineering, somebody has studied law, somebody studied medicine. So we talk about knowledge in terms of skills. And that is the capacity to control the outer world. And that has its utility. Arjuna is an archer and his archery knowledge is vital also for the service he is going to do to Krishna. But if you see in the, not just in the Vedic context, but if you go back to a few, few hundred years ago, or definitely a few thousand years ago, even in the Western world, Knowledge, Socrates, for example, talks about knowledge in terms of virtue. If we have knowledge, I want to see it in how you behave. So virtue refers to the capacity to control the inner world. So what is the best education? Not just that which provides us skills, but that which empowers us with virtues. 
in the bhagavad gita krishna talks about 20 items of knowledge and all of them are virtues because knowledge shouldn't just change what we do externally it changes who we are internally it changes our values it uses it instills virtues within us and among virtues there can be many virtues every virtue manifests our higher side we have a lower side within us we may be selfish we may be manipulative we may be short sighted but when virtues start manifest when when virtues become strong within us then we we don't become manipulative we become more service oriented we don't become short sighted we become far sighted we become more selfless so many virtues can manifest our higher side but the but the only virtue that can take us to the highest reality many virtues can help us live better contribute more in society they can also take us to a higher destination maybe heavens in our future life but there's only one virtue that can take us to the highest destination and that is the virtue of devotion and so in that sense what is the purpose of education what is the best education that which will take us to the highest destination that which will bring about the greatest transformation in our heart that which will manifest the highest virtue and that is devotion so we may we may go to a university to study even while we are having our jobs we may do some parallel learning uh, because nowadays technology keeps changing we have to keep learning all that is useful all that is valuable in its own way but the most important education if we want the highest of our life to be most meaningful and most rewarding is our devotional education so the opportunities that we get to hear about krishna that is the most important education you know for so that is chitan mahaprabhu uh, is pleased with the answer so as devotion also as i mean means three definition of values so what is most auspicious for living entities mahaprabhu asks and then the answer is the association of a devotee of krishna in one sense ramanand rai is speaking about his own fortune he has got association of lord, lord chaitanya mahaprabhu chaitanya mahaprabhu is himself he is a lord but he is in the mood of a devotee but now we may think there are many things auspicious if i win a lottery ticket that will be good if say if in today's world you could say uh, an effective vaccine or a cure for covid is described that will be auspicious may say that okay if climate change is stopped that will be auspicious so there could be many things which are auspicious but ultimately why is the association of a devotee considered auspicious because for anything to have a auspicious result it is the, the inner heart has to be transformed the auspiciousness has to come in the heart in terms of transformation of desires we might get a cure for covid or a vaccine effective vaccine or even a cure for covid but that will that might only start political and economic wars with somebody trying to exploit everybody else based on the cure that they have so unless the, we might we might find some means to remove climate change problems but if, if there is no consciousness change to accompany climate change again we will do something else to pollute the environment in some other way so what does the association of devotees do to understand this we need to understand how desires work we usually think of desires as linear let's say the person is here the object the desirable object is there and i desire that object so that is the normal way desires work we may be passing by a shop and we may it might it might have a new version of a smartphone being displayed in its uh, windows oh i want to buy that so or we might see something on our phones or laptops some, some advertisement so we see a person and we see a desirable object however desires often are triangular they are not just linear there is a person there is a desirable object and there is a person savoring relishing enjoying displaying the desirable object so most companies when they want to advertise their products they don't just show the product they show the product endorsed by certain certain celebrities in fact sports players say for example in india cricketers they they don't earn so much through their sports play as they earn to the if they become superstars they and earn to endorsements why is the idea if a top sports player top cricketer is saying i i use this phone so oh, let people think oh that person is using let me also use so our desires are also triangular not just linear and this is especially true for spiritual desires why especially true for spiritual desires because in in the case of spiritually desirable objects 
they may not look especially attractive you know if depending on what our particular interest is material objects they just look very attractive whether it is whether it is a latest lifestyle product or whether it is another kind of sense object it looks attractive but how many of us we look at a bhagavad gita or we look at chaitanya charitamrita and think oh this is so attractive i want to read it that doesn't happen so often so the spiritually desirable objects may not catch our attention simply by looking at them so the contact with them may not create that desire however if if the, whether it is bhagavad gita or chaitanya charitamrita if we meet some devotee who is relishing this but they come up with fresh insights based on that book they are they get so much joy in talking about it they are animated with love in dis- in discussing that then we think what is there in this book i want to know about it maybe they are finding so much i'll find something over there so quite often when we uh, when we associate with someone who has devotional desires that infuses us with devotional desires so ultimate desirable object is krishna and when we associate with those who love krishna the love for krishna or at least the desire to love krishna starts becoming activated in our hearts and that is how actually speaking we all become spiritually inspired so for us the biggest transformation is earlier talk about transformation of values that's true along with that we want to transform our desires as presently we may if we have basic philosophical understanding we may value bhakti we may value devotion but still our desires are not yet transformed we may value as devotion is very important i want to chant properly i want to study scriptures but so many other desires come up so desire transformation of values is more at an intellectual level transformation of desires is more at the level of the mind or the heart depending on what kind of desires are there so this transformation happens by the association of devotees and that's why association of devotees now is not just a physical thing oh i came to a temple and associated no how much did i get the desires of those devotees did that desire of that transfer of desire is the essence of association so association of devotees is most auspicious because it the association enriches us it transfers into our heart the desire that will bring the greatest auspiciousness the desire to love krishna then one more thing we'll discuss in this what is the greatest unhappiness now we may think oh if i lose if i lose my job if my relationship breaks down or if i get some terrible crippling disease and yes all these can be terrible and you know they are they are troubling but here he says to not have the association of krishna's devotees is the greatest unhappiness now why is that what what is the meaning of this let's try to understand it from one pers- from many perspectives we could take it it's that in the association of devotees we experience krishna yatra gayanti mad bhakta tatra tishthami narada naham vasami vaikunte yoginam hrudaye shiva yatra gayanti mad bhakta tatra tishthami narada so wherever there is krishna wherever so krishna says i am not present in vaikuntha i am not present in the heart of the yogis i am present wherever devotees are glorifying me now this is a example of scriptural statement which cannot be taken literally it is rhetorical for emphasis krishna is present in vaikuntha krishna is present in the heart of the yogis but he is not accessible for us there how can we go to vaikuntha how do we peer into the hearts of the yogis but we can experience krishna's presence in the association of devotees who are glorifying krishna so yatra gayanti mad bhakta where devotees speak about him sing about him we all can experience krishna and once we experience krishna that is such a relishable experience there is so much fulfillment and enrichment in that that the devotee feels there is nothing comparable to with this yam labdhwa chaparam labham manyate nadhikam tata having attained this there is nothing else to be attained or yadrasamrut that was the bhagavad gita the bhagavatam says the same thing yadrasamrut truptasya nanyatra syadrati kochit once we get this taste there is no other taste that will attract a person 
So the point is, in the association of devotees, when we experience Krishna, when we experience the highest happiness, and then that association goes away. And then we, I cannot experience that same higher happiness. And I cannot experience Krishna. And that is the greatest unhappiness for a devotee. Now we may say, can't we by our own devotion experience Krishna? Well, yes and no. Let's understand this. Yes. You know, we all can, whatever situation we are in, we can try to remember Krishna. And if we can focus our mind and heart on Krishna, we can experience him, no doubt. But there is a there are limitations. So how it is? This is based on Bhagavad Gita 10.9. Machitta madgata prana bodhayanta parasparam kathayantashyamam nityam tushyanti charamanticha. So what happens over here is that Krishna says that when my those who are devoted to me come to come together, they relish discussing about me and they relish enlightening each other about me. So what happens is, see, we Krishna is unlimited. We relish him from a particular perspective, and another devotee relishes Krishna from another perspective. Now there may be similarities, but there will also because there, because we are all individuals, there will also be differences. And when we discuss with other devotees, what happens is we appreciate how they are appreciating Krishna. And they appreciate how we are appreciating Krishna. And there is no joy like that. Oh, oh I didn't think about that point. Yeah, I never, never, never perceived it that way. So that's how it's one thing to know Krishna and to become absorbed in remembering Krishna. It's quite another to learn newer and newer facets of Krishna. To, to hear the same words, but explain from a different perspective. Oh, I never thought like that. So that's why in association of devotees, our, we could say our relationship with Krishna expands and deepens. Our appreciation for Krishna, it intensifies. So that's why this is bodhayantaha parasparam. We are mutually enriched. So individual remembrance of Krishna is wonderful and we all need to cultivate that. The same verse also says, Madgataha pranaha. Our we remember Krishna, Prabhupada translates it over there as not just the devotees think of me, he says, the thoughts of my pure devotees dwell in me. In 10.9, he says. So that means dwell in me means Krishna is the home for the thoughts of the pure devotees, for the mind, for the heart. Their thoughts may go to various places, but as soon as there is an opportunity, it comes back to Krishna. Just like we may go to various places, but as soon as the work is done, come back home. So we, we, we should think about Krishna constantly. We try to cultivate our personal relationship with Krishna. But simultaneously, when we associate with others, there's a special flavor which comes as our, our principle for Krishna expands. And this brings us to a paradox over here that Krishna uses the word bodhayantaha. Bodhayanta means to enlighten. And this is 10.9 and 10.8, he has already said that, that they are Buddha, they are enlightened. The word Buddha, Aham Sarvasya Prabhu, Mattaha Sarvam Pravartate, Iti Matva Bhajante Maam, Buddha Bhava Samanvitaha, Buddha. So Buddha is cognate, it comes from the same root as Buddha. Buddha means not just the uh, head of a particular religious tradition. But Buddha generically means the enlightened one. So they are already enlightened because they know Krishna. And how can the enlightened enlighten each other? That is because Krishna is unlimited. Now God outgrows every frame we use to see him. So we may analyze Krishna from a particular perspective. And it's wonderful to use that perspective to understand Krishna. But then we understand that actually Krishna is bigger than this perspective. So we may follow a particular religious path and we come to know Krishna by that and that's wonderful. But we understand Krishna is bigger than um, any religion. But Thura Thakur says that God is not the monopoly of any religion. God is the universal heritage for all of humanity. So religion is meant for God. God is not meant for religion. The point is that no matter how much we know Krishna, there's always so much more to know about Krishna. In this way, the enlightened keep enlightening each other. So these are just a few glimpses of the content of the conversation that happened between Lord Chaitanya and Ramananda Rai.
So now we move to the last two parts, this relatively small parts. We'll discuss what are the consequences of this conversation. And then lastly, what is the relevance? So what have what are the consequences? First, uh, as the conversation went forward, Lord Chaitanya gave him, uh, gave Ramananda. I was so pleased with him that he gave him darshan. He gave darshan of the Sri Krishna Chaitanya Radha Krishna Nahi Anya. So he's, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu manifested as a divine couple, Radha and Krishna. So the very subject that Ramananda was talking about, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu revealed that he was, he was, uh, we could say, the subject, he was the object of that subject. Subject is a, what the topic that we are discussing. And what are they discussing about? They were discussing about Krishna, Radha Krishna. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu gave him darshan. That, in, that indicated how pleased Lord Chaitanya was with him. So that was the immediate consequence. But there was a bigger consequence also. We see that from this point onwards, Lord Chaitanya starts manifesting more and more of the Radha Bhav. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is Sri Krishna Chaitanya, Radha Krishna Nahi Anya. He's Radha and Krishna. Uh, till this point, till the 8th chapter in the Madhya Leela, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is largely, largely in the mood of Krishna who is doing prachar. He's in the mood, mood of Krishna establishing the Yuga Dharma. But from his, from the time he associates with Ramananda Rai, you know, Krishna is, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is both Radha Krishna. As Krishna, he establishes Dharma. As, as Radha Rani, he just, relish, he just relishes Krishna, relishes the love of the divine couple. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu starts relishing this more and more. The Radha Bhava within Krishna, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu starts manifesting more and more. It's there before, but it's more of devotion to Krishna, not specifically Radha Bhava. This is of course elaborate subject. Uh, but this is, this is this, so there is an immediate transformation, there is immediate consequence and there is a long-term consequence. Same way for Ramananda Rai, what when he see, he's himself ecstatic speaking about his exalted subjects, but when he sees the darshan, he has the darshan of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu as the divine couple, he just loses consciousness, he faints. And he, after some time he comes back to consciousness and he offers profuse prayers, glorifying Lord Chaitanya and thanking him for the great fortune he's been bestowed. And then Lord Chaitanya says, actually, I want more of this fortune. I want to discuss more with you. And you come with me and stay with me in Jagannath Puri. And Ramananda Rai, he's so ecstatic. He says, yes, I'll do it. Now, Ramananda Rai has a huge responsible position. He has enormous wealth. And giving it up, you can't do something like that without the sanction of the king. Now, sometimes somebody may have a very wealthy job and they may just, they just give up the job. They're also normally have to do some kind of KT knowledge transfer before you go. But at least in a company, in a democracy, we can give up the job whenever we want. But in a monarchy, if a, if a person suddenly gives up the job, then the king will get into trouble. The king may get angry. And that can get the person into trouble also. We see the difference that when Rupa and Sanatan Goswami wanted to wanted to give up their job, Rupa Goswami was able to give up. But Sanatan Goswami, when he tried to give it up, uh, the employer in that case was a, was a tyrannical king. And now Abu Sain Shah, he imprisoned Lord Chit, he imprisoned Sanatan Goswami. So it was a risky thing to do for him. So he gave up the world. Ramanandra, he was so attracted to Lord Chaitanya's association, he gave up the world. But what happened? He, giving, he gave up the world for the Lord's sake. He got the Lord. And he also got the world in the sense that Pratap Rudra, his king was also devoted. And he was so pleased that you had the opportunity to serve Lord Chaitanya. He says, I will, I will provide you for all material, for all your material needs. You will not have any lacking. You will not lack anything at all. And in this way, he was not a loser. He was enriched spiritually and he was also enriched materially. That's of course exceptional. But that indicates that the principle that when we renounce for the Lord's sake, we will be enriched. And then last part, we'll see what is the relevance for all of us. Now, the whole point is, we, this is such an exalted conversation. If we go into the specifics, we'll find that uh, there is nothing as deep and as exalted in any world literature. Uh, many world literatures talk about love of God. On the spiritual path, there is a universal aspect and there is a confidential aspect. The universal aspect is that 
we all appreciate that love of god is the highest value that has been taught in various traditions and shri prabhupad even said when some christians approached him and asked what do you think about jesus he said that he is our guru a surprise how you yeah. is because he had so much love for god that he was ready to lay down his life for the sake of god so if somebody has so much love we bow down to him we worship him we treat him as our guru so prabhupad was very inclusive in that sense that he he said that there is we can appreciate love of god wherever there is it is there that's the universal aspect but simultaneously there is a confidential aspect while love of god is talked about in many of the world's great theistic traditions but the the levels of love of god the lovability of god and the loving dealings between the lord and his topmost devotees all these are revealed specially in the gaudiya vishnu tradition and this is a treasure that we need to treasure so not in the sense of superiority and pride you know i am be- my religion is better than your religion not in that sense or my tradition is superior to yours but in the sense of deep gratitude we did not do anything to deserve this we just got it so at the fortune that we have got we are deeply grateful this highest revelation has been given to us and then that the eagerness to savor it and to share it that we relish this this supreme gift of the highest love and we strive to share it with others so lord chaitanya had both these moods you know he was savoring love for krishna and he was also sharing love for krishna and that is the mission of all the followers of lord chaitanya we savor the love of for krishna through our personal devotional practices we do them very intense very seriously that we savor that love for krishna and then we share it with others through our outreach activities and that is the way we can treasure the treasure with which we have been bestowed in in the gaudiya vishnu tradition through exalted conversations like this chaitanya ramananda samvad so i'll quickly summarize so today we discussed about the chaitanya ramanand samvad in broadly four parts first i talked about the context it is the unlikeliest of conversations because from a social pers- from a cultural and a f- economic perspective it is unlikely that they two would hug each other and talk to each other from a cultural perspective ramanand rai was a shudra and he was a grahastha chaitanya mahaprabhu sanyasi and a brahmana on the other hand he was a wealthy person a wealthy person might respect a sanyasi from a distance but hugging and talking intimately that's the the context is it's remarkable we show how devotion goes beyond all conceptions and conventions that we might normally have then we talk about the content how from the level of uh, dutifulness in an ordinary ordinary sense to the highest level of pure love for the divine couple that the conversation goes over various hierarchies and then i talk specifically within that about radharani's love as being described the most selfless and therefore the most exalted and the devotion as transformation of values uh, redefinition of values we talk about three things the highest education is that which imparts within us the highest virtue that is love for krishna the most auspicious thing is that which tra- brings about the most auspicious transformation in our heart and enriches us with the most auspicious desire to love krishna and that is association of devotees and the greatest unhappiness is that which strips us of the source of the highest happiness and the source of the highest happiness is the association in which we can association of exalted association of devotees whereby we can learn more and more about our beloved our all attractive lord and then lastly we talked about the consequence was lord chaitanya revealed his divine form of divine divine couple and uh, and we talked about the consequences and relevances not that we become proud but we become grateful and we savor and we share thank you very much shri gauranga mahaprabhu ki jai do we have time for yes prabhu we do have anybody who has a question please unmute yourself and ask a question please 
Hare Krishna, Chaitanya Chiran Prabhu. This is Paramurupa Das. Please take my mother's name. Very beautiful deliberation on this exalted topic. Uh, one of my personal favorites as well. I have actually two questions. Maybe I will just ask one. If there is time, then I'll ask the second one. The first question um, is uh, on the, the description of the hierarchy, um, the third level where the Sarva Dharman Parityajya Mamikam Sharanam Prajam. So the emphasis you placed on was the renunciation of duty. And uh, one may not do it with proper realization because of which it is placed at that level. And um, if we take that whole verse in its entirety, then uh, the notion of Keval Bhakti can be understood even from that verse because uh, it is the Sarva Dharman Pariteja Maam Ekam Sharanam Vraja is also there together with that. So if it is done with proper realization, then that verse can communicate the fifth level, which is the Keval Bhakti. So I want to hear from you um, okay. how that is identified as an external on the basis of probably um, improper understanding of that verse or improper application of this verse. Okay, good point. So when we say that that verse, Sarodhaman Bhattaja, that is the culmination of the Bhagavad Gita, and that is actually at the level of Kevala Bhakti because it's talking about Mami Kam Sharanam Raja also. So, uh, so why is that verse not considered to be the highest level? Yes, I also had that question. And uh, I haven't yet found an answer, uh, which is, uh, we could say, uh, which is absolutely conclusive. But there are some thoughts I had, as I mentioned, one thought is that if we consider within the hierarchy, within the hierarchy, the, the verse that is quote, the verse is quoted for a particular purpose. So within the hierarchy, how it's going is we do your duty. We infuse our duty with, with, the, with some amount of devotion. But then we realize that actually in the world, there is still entanglement. So what do we do? We renounce the world. And then we realize the Brahman. And then we realize beyond the Brahman is Bhagawan. And then we realize that, that that Bhagawan can be accessed. I don't have to renounce the world for accessing the Bhagawan. So that's why we have Stane, Siddha, Shruti, Gitaam, Tanuvan, Manobhe. That wherever you are just here about Krishna, the important thing to access Krishna is not to renounce the is not to simply to do our duty or to renounce the duty. It is not to be in the world or to be out of the world. It is, uh, it is to be connected in the association of devotees through hearing. So we can say that uh, that verse is quoted in a particular context, and in that context, renunciation is what is stressed in the in the flow of the thought. That Saradharman Paritpaja is more stressed than Mami Kam Sharanam Raja, and that's why that verse is placed over there. Now, if we consider verses in general, each verse can have multiple points within it. So, for, for example, we had Atma Ram verse, Atma Ram Ashtamunayo, that verse from the first canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, which Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has explained in many, many different ways. And the, uh, the idea is that one verse can have many, many different applications based on different contexts. So, when someone quotes a verse, for in what context they are quoting it is very important. So, for example, I mentioned about this uh, triangular desires. Now, is there a scriptural reference for that? I am sometimes asked when I speak this. Now, it's a common sense point, but one scriptural reference I found in Prabhupada's works itself is Prabhupada quotes Sangat Sanjayate Kamaha. Now, and he says, in association desires develop. Now, if you look at the verse in the original context, that is 262. So there actually Sangha doesn't refer to, it is, it is, it is referring to attachment. In it, when we are attached to something, when we contemplate something, desire develops. We, we associate with, we contemplate, we associate with something by contemplating on it. Then desire develops. So what Prabhupada does is he decontextualizes that verse. In, in the context of that verse, Prabhupada is, uh, in the context of that verse, it is more of mental association with sense objects through contemplation. But Prabhupada decontextualizes that verse and he says, 
that sangat sanjayate kama in association desires develop so sometimes some desire, some verses may make a particular point in the context of their overall flow sometimes the verses may make some other point in the con- outside that context so if we consider prabhupad would quote for offering food to krishna he would quote the verse yagya shishta ashina santo muchante sarva kal bishay now that that's a valid application of that verse however look at the third chapter of the bhagavad gita krishna is talking about yagya in terms of the fire sacrifices that are done so that there can be harmony between various levels of the universe so krishna is not exactly talking about doing a puja to offer food to krishna to uh, to so now but prabhupada is using that words that words can have a particular wisdom within the context it can have different kind of wisdom also in the context also the principle is still applicable so same way when we are we are say placing a words in a different context see in the original context of the text the words has a certain meaning when we place that verse in another context now sometimes that may misrepresent the verse completely you know and that's why sometimes we may have some prabhupad quotes which seem to be very provocative in terms of today's uh, today's values of political correctness or something but if we see prabhupad so that's a mis there's a misunderstanding or misapplication of those verses completely but in some ways uh you could say that scriptural verses are like lego toys you know or lego toy pieces so within the scripture those verses are put in particular arrangement to convey a particular meaning but you could take that one verse or even one line from a verse and that's like a lego toy piece and we place it in another framework and another toy is formed over there so now whether that usage is valid or invalid that has to be seen carefully you know what is the meaning that is being constructed here what was the meaning over there and that has requires careful thought but that that's one reason why uh, scripture verses when are so versatile that when we say nava nava rasa dhamanya there is newer and newer rasa because one reason why there is newer and newer rasa is that we we can approach scripture from different contexts so if we read the chaitanya charitamrita five years ago and now we read it again we will relish it in a much different way why because the context of who is reading it has changed you know we we just by the passage of time itself we change and if the passage of time is accompanied with the practice of sadhana then definitely there is a change in our consciousness then we read it the same book again we'll find there is so much so much more to relish over here so we could say that uh, when we come to scripture from a different context we really realize different points of the scripture now some people may some people come with ulterior motive uh, to misinterpret scripture or to put scripture to read scripture according to their agenda and that can lead to problems so we have to be careful uh, so i would say there is quoting verses in in the original context quoting verses in a different context and quoting verses completely out of context or opposite to the original context so there are three different things in the original context then outside the original context but still while fulfilling the purpose of the scriptures and then quoting them so out of context that we defeat the purpose of the scripture so this particular quoting of the verse is in the second level so in the original context it is talking about kevala bhakti but in the context of this conversation a part of that verse has been quoted to highlight the principle that just renunciation of duty alone is not enough okay thank you so much um, i think uh, your answer is very satisfying happy to be of service to thoughtful question hare krishna hare krishna prabhu uh, can i ask you a question uh, yes please uh, prabhu the, uh, thank you for the class uh, all glories to glorious shri prabhu pad Uh, prabhu uh, the, the you know i really have deep gratitude for my good fortune to have been exposed to this to this tradition uh, but so in that in that context you know uh, you know i'm trying i'm trying to understand some of the things that you said in the class one was about intellectual transformation through transformation of values and then mind and heart transformation through transformation of desires now my you know i'm now i'm extrapolating from there is there a physical transformation to prabhu and 
and how important that is and uh, you know in terms of our cleanliness of our habits and um, you know of course you know I, i know the four regulatory principles and all that but but in terms of you know even attire and you know wearing chandan and uh, you know wearing a dhoti and then uh, you know now my other question second part of the question is can this be done in any order or is there an order or um, you know how does this happen prabhu okay see so is there a external transformation also along with the say the transformation of the level of the intel of the intelligence and the mind and the heart this is a delicate question and we let's focus first on the principle and then we'll go to the specifics the principle is yena kena prakarena manah krishna niveshayet somehow or the other remember krishna that is the key principle now having said that as the key principle now how do we go about remembering krishna so each one of us is an individual in our own right and we all have to because we all come from particular backgrounds we all have particular uh, inspirations particular uh, uh, a particular inclinations so there is a certain level of individuality in how we can best remember krishna so so niyamagraha is one of the dangers in the on the path of bhakti where what happens is either we reject the rules because we consider them external uh, or we insist on the rules so much that we forget the principle so we reject the rules because we consider them unimportant or we cons- we just neglect them completely uh, sorry we either neglect them completely or we insist on the letter while forgetting the spirit so let me explain this with a with a slide so this is when we follow when we are trying to practice krishna bhakti or share krishna bhakti with others the tradition is what comes from the past and then that tradition is coming from the past and the central circle is the living tradition it is the expression of the tradition as it exists now it exists slightly above the contemporary world but it has to be linked with the contemporary world it cannot be so above that the contemporary world so the bottom circle is the contemporary world is the uh, so now you the tradition needs to be linked with the, the living tradition needs to be linked with the past that is that is done through fidelity through faithfulness and the living tradition needs to be linked with the present with the current world and that has to be done through flexibility so flexibility means for example when prabhupad came to america he always said that i have not changed one thing i just like a postman delivering the message Hmm. Prabhupada insisted on his fidelity, and not as insisted he, he he was faithful, no doubt. But at the same time, Prabhupada was flexible. The very first center which he built, that or which he started with the with the twenty six second avenue, and that twenty six second avenue, what was it about? It was about uh, it was a simply store front converted into a temple. he wanted some people from india to sponsor the sahim and they were ready to sponsor but they said we want to build a traditional temple prabhupad said you know indian government will not allow that much foreign exchange to come he says no if you're not building a traditional temple we are not interested so they lost the opportunity prabhupad prabhupad converted us to offer into temple and that did not follow the traditional architectural rules but that center actually fulfilled the purpose of a temple far more than what a traditionally conforming architectural temples might have performed because they glorified krishna attracted people to krishna attracted people to krishna so prabhupad was flexible also so the point here is fidelity connects us with the tradition flexibility connects us with the contemporary world and a living tradition has to have both so what happens is that in every tradition there are conservatives and there are liberals so the conservatives are primarily concerned about fidelity this is how it was done in the past and this is how we should continue doing it and the liberals are concerned about their flexibility you know this is this is where people are at and we need to reach out to them if we don't reach out to them what is the use of doing things so if we if we are only having fidelity without flexibility then what happens is 
we the tradition becomes too disconnected from the world then it just becomes like a museum museum exhibit that means oh this is how people were living in the past this is how they were practicing krishna bhakti but today nobody is practicing it there is one devotee recently he he is writing a paper he said he said probably by 2050 the way our movement is going we will write by 2050 will write the obituary of the last western devotee in our movement iskon will become a completely indian movement because the way we are going we are not able to attract any western people so do we want that so in the western world we'll just become oh, one once it was a multicultural movement now it has become an indian movement so fidelity without flexibility will make us a museum exhibit so that is the danger of being too conservative on the other hand if we are too liberal if there is flexibility without fidelity then we'll just become another part of the material world we'll just become consumed consumed by the contemporary culture will become a fashion trend so we need to have both fidelity and flexibility that's what keeps it keeps it living and keeps it a tradition so now coming to a specific question about externals uh say whether it is wearing a particular dress wearing particular tilak wearing a particular say kanthi mala now how important are each one of these first thing is definitely they're not unimportant mm. they're not unimportant the externals can help us to can to uh, to also develop the internals at the same time just because the externals help us to develop the internals does that mean necessarily that the ex- those same externals will help everyone to develop the internals that is something which is a different question so uh, if we see within the history of our tradition also chaitanya mahaprabhu's followers went to manipur and manipur was probably one of the few uh, states in india which was actually almost entirely vaishnav state there was vaishnav bhakti all over the world all over the country in india but prominent so prominent uh, was only in that state so now what happened is so for generations there are manipuri devotees who were who were follow the lord chaitanya they were worshiping they were doing gaudi vaishnavism they were practicing gaudi vaishnavism and then our movement went there and we started a center and our movement's devotees they started telling these people who had been born multiple generations they were gaudi vaishnavas that you know if you don't wear dhoti kurta like this if you don't put tilak like this if you don't wear kanti mala like this if you don't do like this then you are not actually a devotee well 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 you might have been a devotee for 10 15 years and they have been devotees for multiple generations so you needn't be so presumptuous so the point is that when chaitanya mahaprabhu's followers went to manipur and they preached in manipur they didn't expect the manipuri devotees to give up their dress their way of living just to practice bhakti now when you talk about way of living there are many things within it So there are some aspects of the culture which are uh, which are anti devotional some aspects of culture which are non devotional some aspects of culture which may be pro devotional so those who are anti devotional they need to be given up so we know the bhakti sardana maharaj was from was from manipur and he actually had this manipuri kirtan kirtans manipuri performances which would happen and they added to the richness of bhakti culture many of the festivals in mayapur and other places he had them go all over the world perform manipuri dance it was a manipuri devotional dance if they had given up their manipuri culture and simply adopted the bengali way of dancing and doing kirtans which we normally do in iskon then that aspect of the culture would not be an added attraction so the point is cultural diversity is very much included in bhakti now where does diversity lead to discord where does diversity lead to disconnection that has to be carefully understood so the so the principle i'll give in conclusion is that we need to the key thing is the internal transformation and there has to be the appropriate externals that foster the internal transformation so now what will be the appropriate externals that may vary according to culture so Now, every somewhat spiritual tradition they they will encourage modest dressing for example now what might be modest dressing in the west might be different from what is modest dressing in india when the britishers came to india 
in that at that time there was something called the victorian age and if you study the history of britain victorian morality is often quite lampooned now those people are so puritanical so when the victorian people came to india you know they wrote books about and they wrote books about india and one of the themes that comes so common is that this indian women have no sense of chastity purity morality this is what you may say he says that they wear dresses which expose their midriff to everyone they ex- they wear they wear dresses in which their feet and their ankles can be seen by everyone this is this is obnoxious now we may say is this the kettle calling the cat black well in in their culture at that time you know for a woman to oh, expose her legs was considered almost that if she is exposing her legs that indicates that uh, it's a it's a come to me message that's what was done by society girls so now india is a hot country now nobody wears footwear in terms of foot clothes so it's not just women it's not just men nobody wears that unless it's cold so they were imposing their cultural standards on indians and they were saying oh these indian women are so unchaste and we indians may look at western women and they may wear a particular dress and we say this is so unchaste this is so impure well even in the western culture there is there is modest dressing and there is a modest dressing so rather than focusing on the particulars of the dress we can look at the principle the external should be such that they foster the internal so the the traditionalist so if if the conservative say that these are the externals that have fostered internals and therefore everybody should follow this well maybe maybe not the liberals they say actually the externals don't matter the internals only matter therefore whatever externals are there that's okay well maybe maybe not now some externals may not foster the internals Now, if somebody wears very revealing clothes, uh, uh, then then you know they are they are at, even if they are not in bodily consciousness, they say ah, this is just the way I dress. It's not likely they are themselves in going to be born in bodily consciousness, and they are going to put others in bodily consciousness. So there are limits to how conservative we can be, and there are limits to how liberal we can be. So the externals need to be chosen in such a way that the internals are fostered, and for some people. continuing with the externals as they were in the tradition is the best way to foster the internals for some people doing some adaptive ad- ad- adjustments so that uh, people they can they can focus their attention to the internals that may be appropriate does it answer the question yes yes prabhu uh, this it did so I, I, it was very clear for me thank you so shall we stop here Okay. If anyone has any question, maybe this is last chance. Otherwise, we can we can wind up here. Okay. Okay, Prabhu. Thank you for such a wonderful uh, philosophical and quite thoughtful class. Uh, very uh, very educative class, Prabhu. Uh, we really relished the whole the entire class, and this has set a trend now because, uh, of course, uh, going forward, I, I think whenever we have such interesting topics, um, especially with any tatwa, uh, we would we would request you that kindly uh, enlighten us uh, on, on those topics. Uh, yes, however, I think uh, we also understand that our time zones are different. but we'll do consider that in mind and uh, we may keep some extra buffer time so that devotees can have some question answers uh, session so so that they can uh, clarify uh, the doubts and uh, strengthen their their philosophy okay uh, i think i take this opportunity once again prabhu and on behalf of entire iskon boston congregation i i deeply uh, appreciate your association and your enlightening lecture Uh, uh, on the gaurila especially the chaitanya mahaprabhu and uh, the ramanand rai samvad which is very complex but you have actually very beautifully analyzed uh, and simplified it uh, thank you prabhu I really appreciate that once again uh, uh, our deep gra- deepest gratitude to you prabhu thank you for this wonderful services
kindly uh, to serve yeah kindly a gratitude by loudly uh, chanting hari bol once for uh, his grace chaitanya charan bol hari 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 krishna hari krishna hari krishna dear Uh, for those who want to who want to stay in touch with prabhu there is a the spiritualist.com uh, through that a uh, website you can you can connect with him and also prabhu has one more site which is an official website of him uh, chaitanacharan.com so please visit these websites you, you you can actually get more resources of prabhu and if anybody wants any of his books so kindly let me know i have some copies of his uh, of all his books um, i can share with you all okay thank you there are a couple of other websites so just a quick second There is Gita Daily dot com, where I write every day on a small three hundred word reflection on the Bhagavad Gita. I, yes, I pasted that over there in the chat box. And there is another website I started a few months ago. It's called Spiritual Words Daily dot com, where every day, if those who want to improve their vocabulary and their spirituality simultaneously, that's a website where I take one word of a say a graduate or postgraduate level, and then I illustrate how to use it using. three sentences one based on the ramayana one based on the mahabharat and one based on the bhagavad gita that's spiritual words daily so gita daily and spiritual words daily thank you very much hare krishna hare krishna dear hari bol god pramod hari bol hari bol hari bol hare krishna so do you do you thank you for for our sessions uh, for our forthcoming sessions please stay tuned and uh, kindly uh take a look at our website and also uh uh on your, on your chat groups you will be updated uh, regularly hari krishna hari krishna thank you oh hari krishna dear goodies i just have a couple of things because i think we uh since we had this uh, session long